Today we're going to paint white things without using any white paint, and I'm going to show you some examples of that. Let's get started. Today we're going to talk about how to paint white. And so let's start with this. This is a painting that I did of two peaches, and what I did was I took a picture of it, and you can see it in black, white, and gray. So what you want to be able to do is translate color, using color, in order to create form. In order to create form, you have to have darks, mediums, and lights. And that's what's happening in this picture. And in a second, I'm going to show you what we're going to do is we're going to look at the original painting. So if you desaturate something completely from all color, you want to make sure that it still reads in terms of form and volume. And that's really what we're trying to do as painters, or one of the things we're trying to do as painters. So now let's look at the original, which was a saturated color version. All right, here we go, and there it is in color. So what you have to sort of learn to do in your brain is to not see color as color, not to see red or yellow or violet, but instead to kind of squint your eyes and see them as darks, mediums, and lights. And if you can do that, then you're able to create form. So it's like translating a language. You're translating color into how light or dark something is, which is value, and therefore, therefore creating form. Now, one of the tools that I use to do this is something called the No Tanizer. And this is something that I use on my um, iPad. This is a tool that I can put my photographs into, and then I can use a dial that's on the uh, app, and I can dial in how much white I want to preserve, how much dark I want to preserve, and how much of the midtones I want to uh, consider. So it's a way that I can evaluate a photograph carefully and also a way if I get stuck and I'm not sure of the value of something in relation to something else, I can use this tool. It's very cheap. I think it's $3 or something, and I use it almost every day. Now let's take a look at a white form. This would have been a peony, and as you can see, what I've done here is I've used violet for my darks, and I've used sort of a neutral, a warm neutral, which is uh, that sort of a brownish color, and, um, and preserve the whites of the paper for the whitest whites. That's sort of oversimplifying what's happening here, but what I wanted to show you is that right now it really doesn't read very much as a form because the peony doesn't have a lot of form. But what I want you to look at is just the translation of instead of using black, white, and gray, in order to create darks, mediums, and lights. What I did was I mixed colors. I used violet, and I used quite a bit of a warm gray, which is that, what I'm talking about, being brown or sandy color, because that's warm. As long as something is tilting toward the um, sunlit side of the um, color wheel, then it's gonna be warm, and if you go toward the darker side of the color wheel, which is your violets, your blues, and your dark greens, then it's going to read as cooler. So it makes a nice balance of dark, medium, and light, but I'm also considering temperature, how light or uh, how warm or cold something is, warm or cool, I should say, because that contrast is helpful. Now this is the same painting, but with the background put in. And I think you can see that the background actually created the form. That's not exactly true. I had to have painted those shapes correctly in terms of their value, but having the dark background does make it pop and does allow your brain to see some of those forms as individual petals, or, or at least read as something that is not just flat on a piece of paper. Now, if you don't call your values correctly, and I don't always call my values correctly by far. Here's a good example of a white peony that I painted, and it's the values are all wrong. Uh, the darks are too dark, the lights are too light, and you see how it, and then the background didn't save it at all. It's just completely flat form, not even a form, just flat shapes. This is a fail. And I wanted to show you a fail and then show you when this happened, it was like I overpainted in a way. I was too aggressive. And here's the same painting or same attempt at a painting, but I preserved the whites by being much less heavy handed. I still followed the roadmap of making sure that my violets were my darks and that my leaning toward yellow grays were um, warm. But you can see that there's actually form there. And if you go back, you'll see how how flattened out the form was. Um, sometimes you can just feel a little overconfident or maybe not, 
not see shapes uh, correctly. And I took some time off and, and I definitely suffered from that. When I came back, I, I wasn't hitting my values correctly. I was, I was definitely off. And, and if it's off, and that whole last painting that I showed you was completely off. It's just, <laughs> there's, there's no way to save it. You know, you have to, for me, I have to rip it up and just call it a day. And then usually after that, the next painting is done with a much more sensitive and careful eye. So I, I, I'm happy with this one. And, but look closely, you'll see a lot of color. There's no gray, there's no black or gray being used here. If, there's some, if they're grays, then they're grays that I have mixed from color. I try to put as much color in my grays as I possibly can and consider whether they're warm grays or cool grays. Now let's look at another photograph. This is maybe one of the most challenging subjects for me, which is that. It is a transparent object with <laughs> on a white, white piece of paper. Um, so the challenge with this, of course, is, well, how, how am I going to make, how am I going to do this? Uh, and how am I going to do it without a tube of gray or black? Uh, the way to do it is just the same way that I showed you so far with a sensitive eye and to mix up grays that are both warm and cool, but that also give me that dark, medium, and light value range. And that does it. Um, you, there's a lot of violet in those darks. There's also some green in those darks. There's, and when you look at the warmer tones, which are mid-toned, if you squint your eye and see some mid-tones, you'll see that they have quite a bit of orange in them or possibly red. I leave the whites of the paper as white as I can. That, that's usually my whitest white, and there isn't much of it there, but there's enough. There's enough to create form, and that was the goal. Now, this is not necessarily, you know, the most interesting painting in the world. One thing you can do if you're doing something that is a really desaturated painting or subject like this is put a really colorful object in your composition if you can. Because what I did with the next one was I put an orange in the composition and that's going to cause some ref reflected light to happen. It also makes the desaturated object appear more crisp. I don't, I don't know if that's the right language or not, but just consider that if you have a, a subject that you're going to do and it has an awful lot of white in it or clear or desaturated color, if you put a very saturated moment in that composition, your whole painting will uh, just sort of be enhanced by that. And, and that's what's happening in this particular subject. And you can see some of the what happens if you put a translucent object near a really saturated object, light starts to bounce around. And not only light bounces around, but the color gets reflected. Those, um, there's a lot of orange spots in that cup, and especially underneath the plate. That's just, you know, from observation, that's just kind of what happens. It was also important not to put a dark background around this whole thing. If I put a really saturated background, like a deep purple around this whole object, I wouldn't have gotten the effect I wanted, which was sort of what I wanted was this delicate moment that was happening between the cup and between the orange. Now let's take a look at another favorite subject of mine. What's coming up is my backyard. My backyard in the summertime is pretty much heaven. Um, I live in Vermont, and so there's snow most of the year, as there is right now, and you think it'll never go away, but indeed it will. So we had a party, and at the end of the party, all the chairs looked as if they were having a conversation together. And I just want you to notice the white of the chair, especially the one that's in front. Um, when I go to paint this, I'm going to preserve the whitest whites that are on that front chair. I'm going to leave them alone. But I have to consider all the whites that are in shadow. And in order to do that, they have to be darker than the whites that are in the sun. Nothing's going to be whiter than the white that's reflected in the sun. And in order to do that, what I do is I use a, a triad that I find particularly helpful. Triad meaning using three colors to fill in value shape. And these three colors were cerulean blue, a rose, and also a Naples yellow. That's my favorite triad for reproducing white in shadow. And you can see it there. And I think it's pretty effective. There's a crispness that comes if you really, really preserve those whites. But the other thing that really makes this painting, I think, work is that um, my darks are very, very, very dark. The, the, the trees or the hedges behind 
all that anchors all that lightness in and provides the contrast. It's really important in paintings, and I know you know this, to have darks, mediums, and lights. And what's helpful here is that there's a nice balance of those things. And, you know, you don't always get the opportunity to do that. You might be doing a commission of a white cat on a white chair, and you're just not going to have the same opportunity. <laughs> and so that's when you have to become uh, pretty creative or use um, artistic license or ask your client for, for another photo. I mean, sometimes, sometimes you just cannot find the value shapes that you need in order to create form. I've had that happen many, many times. Now, what's coming up next is kind of a typical subject for where I live. I live in a rural setting, and so there are, are a lot of barns. They're often white or red. Take a look at, I left the white of the barn as white as the paper. That's going to be my whitest white. And just consider for a minute, I used that triad that I told you about, cerulean blue, rose, and uh, maple's yellow, in order to create that shadow. And that was the whole reason for making this painting in the first time. I was driving by and that shadow was what intrigued me. Oftentimes for me, what I find the most intriguing are, I'm just really interested in shape. So if I see an interesting shape, then I want to consider painting it. I also am very interested in the shapes that happen in the space between things. That just happens to be something that, that fascinates me and it allows me to observe as I go around my day. Now the next thing that's coming up is the, um, I've been painting pet friends just for fun and for love because um, I'm getting back into painting and discovering that uh, how much I do enjoy it. And so if you watch the video before this, it's a much more slowed down, although it's still a time-lapse version of this painting. This is as fast as the um, iMovie will let me paint. But I wanted to show you that this is very similar to painting a peony. He's just a dog-shaped peony, a white peony. So what I have to do is I put in my darkest darks, and then I go and I start to put in or translate the darks into color. So that the darks become a violet and a blue and uh, some neutrals, and the lights, again, lean toward something warm. So I hope that's helpful. Remember to keep the whites of your paper white, your paints wet, mass for value, mix for color. Remember, there's a lot of color in white, and you can find it if you look for it. Please join my YouTube channel. See you next time. Bye-bye.